Zubin, thank you so much for coming down for the interview. I have not seen you for a long time. Um, I, it really is a pleasure to see you again and um, you know um, to find out and from you what you have been doing so far. I think we start this interview by going all the way to the, to the beginning okay. um, to ask right. you about mm -hmm. uh, how you started writing and what got you writing. Uh, well, perhaps like a lot of writers, uh, one is interested in writing from one's reading. And uh, if I may say so, I was <laughs> very interested in poetry from a very, very young age. I think when I was able to read, you know, practically. And uh, what really one of the first uh, books that I chose for myself, which my parents allowed me to do, um, was a book of poems, you know, strangely enough. But I guess uh, b uh, because of uh, the rhythm of uh, the pieces that I read in the book, that got me going. And um, in my early teens, I think I started to, to write a little bit, but uh, they were, you know, really very terrible stuff, full of uh, doggerel, I think. Uh, but one of the earliest ones that I attempted was uh, something for the school magazine. And it was really, um, it had nothing to do with my life. Uh, <laughs> the vocabulary was uh, entirely foreign. Uh, the setting was entirely foreign. It was uh, out, uh, you know, a storm at sea, that kind of thing. And um, later on in my early teens, um, when I thought I was going to explore poetry a little bit more seriously, it came, I think, from my reading of the Victorian and Romantic poets. Um, um, what I liked a lot was Keats and especially um, Tennyson. Uh, and you can imagine at that time, you know, being just sort of learning my way. It was uh, very, very derivative, what I was writing. And um, it was very, uh, I really don't know what the word is for it, but I realized after a time that it was really quite a lot of rubbish I was writing. So uh, to, to put myself right, I actually set out deliberately uh, to write about rubbish. <laughs> I, uh, I thought of, uh, and I went to look at a rubbish dump uh, <laughs> just to get a bit of inspiration uh, for something that's really you know, down to earth and close to life. And uh, I actually wrote a poem about the rubbish dump you know, with flies and everything. Unfortunately, I don't have the work anymore. I wish I, I kept it, you know. But there was a day when, I think I must have been about 14 or 15, ah. you know. And uh, at the time, it seemed okay. I, I did what I was doing for myself, you know. Here am I trying to write something that's uh, close to something that I really have observed and known. But of course, it, it still didn't uh, satisfy what I had in mind to do. And uh, I think there was one day when, in my late teens, I just and got rid of the whole lot of stuff that I wrote that early. Um, but the actual, I think, serious writing came about in my second year at university. Mm. Um, and you were in the, the University of Singapore? Yes, it was called University of Singapore at that time. And uh, my second year was 1966. We had um, uh, Professor D.J. Enright as head of department at the time. And we were a very small uh, single subject uh, group. The class was uh, those of us doing English literature as a single subject. Um, we were, v I thought, a very nice uh, group and being so small, you know, the bonding was fantastic. And also among us was uh, Muhammad Haji Saleh, who was the uh, Malaysian um, writer who, who already had a huge portfolio of poems, you know. He had, he'd been in teacher training in England and um, he showed me some of the, s the things that he had written, and I was amazed, you know, at, at what he had achieved. Uh, so we got to talking about writing and so on, and <clears throat> I think uh, Prof. Enright was quite an influence because of his humanity. I found him to be an extremely kind person, although we were all dead scared of him as well, because he had this um, put-on uh, manner which sort of scared us all. It was deliberate, but I, I found he was really a very, very kind person. So uh, with all the, you know, a kind of uh, a fermenting of uh, interest in writing, uh, that was when I, I, I tried, I think, to write more seriously. And the thing that, the, I think the one piece which um, started me off, where I discovered uh, that I could actually capture something that satisfied me, 
was a piece called Present from the Past. Uh, based on a very, very early experience when I, I took part in a painting competition in public. I still remember it was outside the old uh, cold storage building in Orchard Road. I can't remember the circumstances now, but we had to do a, a kind of watercolour thing. In public, you know, it was quite scary. And uh, there I was, I remember, in a, a, doing that painting of, a, of a, st a street scene. And then this person came up and... Um, I, I heard her from afar, you know, she was like chanting or singing or something. She, she might have been drunk, well, it's a young person, a young woman. She might have been drunk, um, but she came up to me and sort of looked at what I was doing and, and she, she took, I think, a, a, a pen or a pencil or something from me, or a, I can't remember what it was now, and a piece of paper and she said, uh, come, I draw, I draw for you, I draw monkey for you, you know? And she, she did, she did just some sort of... Uh, um, figure on a, on that piece of paper it looked like an amoeba, you know, with eyes, you know. And of course, I was so young then; I was quite sort of startled and quite afraid of what was going on, you know. But um, I, I let her do it, and then uh, she she sort of smiled and laughed and all that. And uh, this took about all of like two or three minutes, you know. And then she was off; she just went off, and I I continued with what I was doing. I I don't know that that incident made a huge impact on me, you know. It uh, sort of was in my mind the whole of the the whole of the day after the after the whole thing was over, and um, when I when I sort of put my mind to it, I decided to write a poem about it because, for me, it was uh, a way of discovering what it was that was provoking me to need to say something. You see, uh, which I did, and that was I think the very very first poem, which to me was a serious attempt at doing what. I've been doing all along with my writing, which is dis to discover what it is I'm thinking. Did you discover at that time uh, through the writing? I did, yes, yes. I discovered that there is a way of drawing um, which makes the drawing come alive. Mm -hmm. uh, and it wasn't what I was doing with my painting, which to me at the time, and I, I, I jolly well knew it, it was overpainted. I put too much effort into it, and to me it was it was not alive. But what this young woman did for me, you know, just at the moment, with her funny little squiggles, to me that was a much more interesting piece of work than my, you know, very careful work there on that piece of paper. And that was what, what came through as I was writing. It was a discovery. It was a wonderful uh, feeling. Mm. That yeah, I had. What about writing itself? Do you think it's quite like painting in that way? Yeah, I, is it about finding something? Uh, Yes, uh, I have been asked, you know, um, why poetry, you know, why, why not something else, you see. And for me, I think the, the, the two things that uh, are important to me, which I don't do very well in their own form, is painting and music. Um, I've tried my hand at painting, at, at uh, oil and at sketching, but you have in mind to do something, but your hand won't do it. You know, your hand cannot achieve the thing that you have in mind to do. So I get very frustrated with that. And for me, I think poetry is a, a way of um, bringing to life something with uh, pictures in the mind. Uh, and also the element of, of music. I love all kinds of music, but uh, I'm not a musician. <coughs> I sing a little bit, but not very well. Uh, <laughs> so I guess... Um, for me, poetry then being uh, where which has you know expressive rhythms, yes. to me that's very very important. To me, poetry is to be heard, you know, not just in your your in your head, but it's to be heard aloud. So I do believe in uh, in, the, in in it being heard when it's read aloud. And these, I think, these two elements that, that painting and poetry, because I can't be a painter, can't be a musician. So in a way, poetry is a kind of compensation. Mm -hmm. Besides the other thing which I, I found with my very first effort, which is that, uh, I mean, I'm a believer in uh, you know, how do I know what I think till I see what I say, you know. So yes. for me, that putting into words, the, the thought that's put into words is uh, for me a very important part of what I do. And the words give clarity to what you're thinking. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. So it's the other way around. I mean, you don't actually see it in your head first. Uh, oh, no, it's no. It's through the words that you see. What oh, yes, absolutely, yes, yes. Because I... Um, most of the time, I don't know what is going to come out until I put it on paper. I mean, this sounds really 
quite sort of crazy. But I know there are other people who also, you know, yes. practice it in the same way. But it just it just begins a feeling, a feeling of being provoked by something. You don't quite know what it is, you know. It's uh, it's not quite formed within you, but you know it. It, it needs to come out in some way. And for me, it comes out in writing. Because I use the, the medium of words to discover what it is you know, that is provoking me. Mm. And I'm quite open to what eventually comes out. Because as the poem, in a sense, you know, writes itself or brings out this thing that is needing to come out, I accept it. I know that there may be, uh, there may be an incident or something which, which uh, triggers off you know, this feeling. And then I'm provoked to find out you know, what is it about this uh, incident that's you know, bugging me enough for me to want to address it in some way, uh, but I'm, I'm quite open to seeing what it is that comes out. It's, it's part of the adventure of it. And uh, it's, yeah, I think that's, that's what I enjoy most, really, about writing. Mm. You yeah. did say just now also the two aspects, um, the imagery and the rhythm, that mm. um, feed into poetry for you. Yeah. Um, does it also um, propel you to explore other genres? I mean, you have started, or maybe uh, you, you did say that you did it previously in quite things like children's writing. Um, I, I've tried my hand also at stories, uh, at short stories, and now um, most recently as a sort of a combination of prose and poetry. But I think my my prose is also, um, in a sense, poetic. Mm. If we want to put it that way, Even because I find that voice. Uh, a kind of precision I, in words. Somehow, I, yes, mm -hmm. yes. It's, it's very important to be... Pre um, and to be thrifty. I think um, a lot of essay writings tend to be... Um, oh, very diffuse yes, and uh, wordy. Yes, like yeah, very yeah. to get to the point. Yes, Whereas yes, I think yes. when I read your writing, always in a sentence you get to the heart. I, I, I believe in uh, using as few words as possible if I can. But uh, so that the thing is, is, is clear enough, I mean, to my satisfaction anyway. And uh, that's one of the principles I always try to follow because um, clarity is extremely important. Um, I, I get a lot of uh, like feedback and, and I, mean, I generally notice a lot of people are afraid of poetry. You mentioned the word, you know, here's a poem, you know, immediately they are turned off. Um, they get afraid, um, they feel, you know, they're inadequate to tackling the thing or reading the thing. And I guess in my own writing, I have tried to um, go for simplicity and clarity. Because I feel um, when, you, when you write a poem, you're actually trying to uncover things. You're trying to bring things to the light, you know, rather than to cover and hide. And um, Do you have to have something to say before you write? Uh, there's a feeling that I might have something to say, but I don't know what it is I want to say, you see. It's an and Yeah, until I write. So, um, sometimes it's just a general orientation towards life that, that makes you feel that. I felt this with my second volume, um, that I finally had something to say. Although a lot of what is in that volume I didn't know what's coming out until it came out. Right. You this see? Is against the next wave. Against the next wave, yeah. 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 Um, that's why, I, I mean, if you compare the early work, the first volume, uh, Prospect of a Drowning, which is actually the work of a, a very young person, yes. a very, very young person, and I was I'm extremely dissatisfied with the poems there. Because a lot of the time I was like, um, I don't know, I, I, I would call it posturing really, you know, um, discovering what it is to, uh, that makes a poem a poem uh, without really being fully, I think, myself. But I cared less what a poem could be when I was doing the work of the second volume. And I think they came out better somehow. <laughs> How has the orientation changed? Is it because you see life a bit more clearly or more idiosyncratically? Uh, I, I think, what I'll, I'm, I, I must admit actually, I've, I'm a very, very shy person. You wouldn't think so, perhaps now. I, I warned but them about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> I'm still being thought of as a recluse. But I'm so much better now, honestly. I'm also a recluse. Oh so, my so goodness. Well, <laughs> welcome to our world then. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah. Uh, oh, where was I? All right. Yeah. I think um, after the after the prospect of a drowning, after that first uh, set of poems, because of my own dis dissatisfaction with them, um, by the time it came to actually, there was a, a hiatus of many years. You know, something like fourteen years where I didn't write. I didn't write a line. Come to think of it. Um, and then when, when the poems of the second volume started to come out, they, they, they came out with a vengeance almost, you know, I just, uh, I wrote something like 50 poems in a few months. It was never happened before and <laughs> it's not happened again, unfortunately. But I, I think it, it came to a point when maybe certain things were happening in my personal life when I felt more ready to, to take risks, you know, to get out of my... Uh, shell, which I didn't enjoy being in, um, partly also because my work at the university required me to like lecture to um, a hall of 200 students or so, and that's, that was for me an initially a very frightening uh, thing to do. Um, one never gets used to it. And, I, I uh, have to make this clear to the camera that um, you are yeah. a lecturer here at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences oh. at the Department of yes, yes. English Language and oh. Literature. Oh dear. Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I guess it was, uh, when, when you say orientation, you know, I think it was a, a, some sort of a decision on my part that I have to get out of this, you know, this, uh, this fearfulness, this timidity or whatever it is. And um, where the writing was concerned, be more, be more open, be more relaxed, you know, be more uh, prepared to just welcome whatever is coming out of me. Uh, and I think it, it happened uh, with that particular set of poems that, made up the second volume. Mm. Mm. And how has that, um, at least second volume, third volume onwards, how has that um, perhaps uh, reinformed your way of thinking about life? Um, the thing is that I think before the second, the poems in the second volume came out, uh, I underwent a sort of spiritual conversion and that sort of got rid of the dryness of the 14 years where I didn't write anything at all, anything worth mentioning even. But um, the writing came back even as my spiritual life grew. And it was very strange because they sort of went uh, hand in hand together. And I think um, subsequent to that, you know, there was... Uh, I've, not, I've not sort of turned back, I think, from that point. And, um, as the spiritual life grew, um, so the writing went along with it. Uh, I, I think I took, I took more um, to ca care, perhaps to think about what I was doing in my writing, and then partly because I was writing, you know, people got more interested in me as a writer, and then I have to do things like interviews. <laughs> Like this one, you know, and um, there was that book that uh, Felicia Chan yes. did, uh, you see, so she, she, she also interviewed me. So I was, uh, all these various things, you know, um, I had to, um, when, I, when I had the, uh, when I was given that, uh, the Sea Right Award, yes, I had to go to Bangkok to receive the prize. And uh, there, we had to go, every day we had to go and visit writers groups in Bangkok itself and talk about our writing, you know, and I'd never done that before. I you can tell it was the scariest thing I had to do. But I found that if I, uh, and that was really something that I learned, if I spoke from the heart, mm. you know, and, 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 and I didn't care too much about really, you know, what sort of impression I made, uh, all the ideas came, you know, and I wasn't at a loss for words at all. That was a really big learning experience for me, going to Bangkok to receive the Sea Writer Award and, and the things I had to do there, of course, with the other writers from Malaysia and, other ASEAN countries. Um, but yeah, I think it, it, uh, the, after the second volume, all the other writing after that um, made me think much more, be, be more sort of conscious about what I was doing in my writing and what my writing was doing for me. Mm. You see? What, what is it about uh, writing, or specifically in your case poetry, that allows you to feel like this or um, to be able to explore your own Self or your spirituality? Mm. I've, I've always had a tremendous respect for words, you know, and 
in my religion, you you learn that God created with words. He spoke creation into being. You know, and uh, in my own writing, I realized that yeah, you you do actually create something with words. And for me, that's what I do when I write a poem. I don't just write uh, poetry as such. I, I write a poem when I can. I see it as the use of words uh, made into a thing with borders, with boundaries, but the effect of which I think uh, goes beyond the boundaries. But I think of a poem as a thing that is created and its life is more than what I can control. To a certain extent, I control what goes into that piece, you know, to make it finish, to give it some shape. Although shape, in, in a sense, finds itself in the way that I write. Um, but the, the impact of it and the effect of it, as I discover not only for myself, but from feedback I get from my readers, it goes beyond what I can control. Uh, but I'm okay with that. I mean, um, once it's done, once I s set it forth into the world as my creation, you know, um, I hope it goes where it's supposed to go. Uh, but I'm okay if it goes where it's not supposed to go either. You know, so uh, for me, that's, that's why the words have been extremely important to me. They've been a creative medium. And uh, I think it's put me in touch, really, with uh, what I would call the Holy Spirit, in a very broad sense, uh, the creative spirit. Because, um, and this is, this, is, this is true, I, I've experienced it for so many years now. There are times when the poem seems to write itself, or parts of a poem anyway. And it's always the, the, the time when I, I let go and try not to control too much. And then the poem writes itself. You know? Those are generally the points that, which are very difficult. Like when I don't know how to end a poem, for example, and I worry about it, and I try this, and I try that, and nothing works. But when I let go, it, it just all comes, and everything is in place. The words, the rhythm, the images, you know. And when I recognize that, there is very little I want to do to tamper with it further. You know, I just, I just know it's, it's correct, it's what it should be, and it's done. Now, where does it come from? I don't know. I just call it the Holy Spirit, mm. really. It's, it's quite Newtonic in a sense, the uh, compilation between uh, the Holy Spirit and Yeah, the yeah, Holy yeah. Spirit. But you see, that I, I, uh, I, I'm a very stringent and critical reader of my own writing. And I think those, those uh, lines, those portions of poems that seem to me to have written themselves, are probably the best parts of the poems, you know. So how, I mean, how do you explain that? I don't know, you know. But I'm, I'm very happy they're there. <laughs> I wish they happened more often. <laughs> and yet, yet poetry, maybe you agree and maybe you may not. Uh, I, I suspect you will. It's not just about words. It's also about the words that are not there, uh, about the silences. Oh, yeah. As yeah. opposed to prose. I think poetry, the, the silences are, you're very conscious mm. of their presence. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, very much so, very much so. Um, it's, it's hard to put this into words, but um, in, in every poem, and I think it's true, the, the, the better the poem, there is a kind of large silence, you know, uh, because, but there are certain things also which, um, the words accomplished by being there but they're not really there, and it, it really depends on uh, what the reader brings to the work also, to be able to grasp what this thing is, this, this, this big silence behind the work that is trying to get through also, through the words. I have no words for it, that's why I call it silence, you know, Maybe but... It's like um, meditation, you read the poem or like kind of prayer. Ah, uh, so yeah. You're, 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 you're quite conscious that something larger beyond those words alone. Oh, yes. And you give the words. Yes, form. yes, yes, yes. Yes. And sometimes, I think it has to do with uh, drawing our attention to the inadequacy of words, you know, um, to what the words can't say. The words say something, but they can't say it all. And that part, you know, which they cannot say, is up to you to, to grasp. And that, that's what I mean by that silence, which is not actually in the poem as such, because I mean, I put words in the poem, I don't put the silences there. But the words are what also create that silence, you know. It's a and, uh, it's about poetry. 
Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The words are, are, are perfect in the way they appear and yet also inadequate because it's, it's set against a, a kind of a silence, a kind of largeness. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I get that uh, uh, in some people's poetry mm. and I get that certainly in yours. Uh, mm. There is a call to think, a call not just to think critically but to meditate. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And meditate not just in the um, philosophical sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I'm glad you see that because that, that's what I think I'd like to achieve. Mm. Not that I consciously do it anyway, it just comes, you know. I just know that it will be there because I, I'm aware of the inadequacy of the words that I use when I'm crafting a poem. But I, I leave it be, you know, up to a certain point you can work on a poem. But you can work it to death, like I did with that painting when I was like, 14 or 15, you know. So um, I must know when to leave it alone, when to give it its own life, you know, because it will have its own life, um, rather than to you know, write it to death, as I said. Does, does poetry change you as a person? Um, Is it something quite distinct from, let's say, uh, your spiritual life and previously your academic life? Um, are they, uh, is it another aspect of you or a truer form of you or how, how, how do you put it in oh, gosh, I to the other uh, I roles you play? Um, poetry has been so integral to who I am and what I do in my life that uh, I think that's why in some ways I've not been able to separate it from who I am and my my academic work. I I really don't like this word academic. I really don't know what it means, you know. (laughs) Because um, I don't, I've not been able to to see my subject, literature, as as simply a subject. And I'm very sad when I get students who see it only as a subject. Because literature has so much to do with life. I mean, it's the writings of a person. It's somebody's heart and soul, you know, gone into a piece of creative writing. And uh, for me, when I, when, I, when I look at it, and I believe I have to teach it, you know, it's to bring out that dimension of it, which is so important. So I don't know what you know, academic writing really means. You know? mm. One tries to be objective, I suppose, and one does one's research. But when it comes down to it, it's got to say something meaningful to whoever's reading it. You know? You're coming in contact with another person in that piece of writing. And I think that's a very human thing. It's not an academic thing, mm. you see. I think academia tends to forget that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, mm. but um, I think throughout uh, my life, I, I see poetry as not, not so much changing me as growing me, mm. in a way, because I discover a lot of things about myself through writing. Um, some of it is like, is quite uh, dismaying. Uh, you feel a lot of inadequacy sometimes when you you want to you want to deal with things which I'll just give you an example there was that poem about um, the famine in Ethiopia you know I had a, a poem in uh, I think one of the collections yes the Ethiopian, Ethiopian mother and child yes, I, think I think it was in the bring of an amen yes I felt so helpless you know and yet I felt I had to write that poem uh, I think that that subject is, yeah, it's based on a, a photo. That of course it was all it, always in the news in the newspapers. There was this one particular photo that struck me one day that came out in the newspapers, and it seemed to me so much like Madonna and Child, yes. you know, except that it was quite different. It was this emaciated mother and emaciated child, and it just bothered me so much. But I knew even as I was writing the poem, and so I, I thought I would, you know, find out. I just, I just needed to write that poem, and I, and I knew it was going to be totally inadequate. It's like something, bes- it's a subject, I don't want to use this word either, but it's, a, it's an event, it's a reality of our world, beside which poetry seems beside the point altogether, you know? You feel the, the total inadequacy of just even addressing this thing with words. And um, what I learned from from writing that about that event, that photo that I saw, was that um, less is more, <laughs> to put it 
succinctly, um, I needed to get the thing to speak for itself. My words are not going to do it. So what I did was just more or less to point out the factual things that I saw in that picture. And hopefully they will, they will speak for themselves without my saying too much about what I felt or anything. The worst was it, you know, to say what I felt, except that I, what I felt was inadequacy, you know, before this, this reality in our world. It's just, it's just too much, you know. And yet, if I hadn't written that poem, I think I, it would have bugged me for days and days and days, you know. Um, maybe it's, it's trying to, I think this applies to a lot of things I write, but I was particularly conscious of it when I was uh, dealing with that particular event. Is I, I need to find out what my relationship is with this particular thing, uh, be it a subject, a thing, an event, a person, you know. And that's why I write, I think. Uh, it's, it's part of that discovery, you know, what do I think, what do I feel about this thing. And in the process when I do that, I discover what the relationship is. And um, for me, in that particular piece, is it was a discovery that, I mean, before certain things, you know, poetry seems like totally irrelevant. Mm -hmm. So that was it. You mentioned so far uh, your relationship to poetry. I'm thinking mm. whether when you write, do you also think that you want to regret somebody? Uh, do you write for someone or to someone? Uh, do you have an idea? Do you want someone to read your poem? Sometimes I do. I mean, uh, there are poems which are actually addressed to people. Yeah. Um, but I think most of the time, it's probably to an imagined reader who might be somebody like myself with some experience of reading poetry. Uh, it's a kind of implied reader. Yeah. Mm. Yes. In, yes. In a very general sense. Mm. Someone mm. who uh, can understand yes. what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. But even if I use a you there in, the, in that poem, it's a very general, in a very general sense. But there are poems that are addressed to, to certain people, yes. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the trajectory of this question really is to ask you uh, mm. whether you think poetry writing has responsibility. Uh, I think the craft is responsible to itself, to be truthful to itself. Um, as far as it understands itself, what it's trying to do. Um, is a certain measure of uh, wisdom important to poetry? That is, um, you have to have something thoughtful to say. Yes, um, but that d really depends on the writer. <laughs> Whether the writer has lived up to that point, you know, to be able to um, to use words in a certain way, to bring out whatever seems wise. I mean, I, one doesn't do it consciously, but hopefully, some things will come out. Like I said, you know, to a certain extent, it's a matter of letting go and and, and trusting that you've got something meaningful to say. Um, I find that later in life, that happens more readily than than when I was younger. So I don't know, maybe I'm growing wise or whatever. I dare not say it, you know, but uh, the way in which one uses words may have something to do with it. Mm. Also, the other aspect uh, mm. we haven't talked about uh, in your writing is humour. Uh, it seems to be coming in more and more. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm enjoying that bit of it. Um, um, I'm going to tell you, humour is a saving grace for anybody. <laughs> yeah. <How> uh, <laughs> I don't know, I've always, uh, I mean, yeah, I've been a very shy person, but I think what keeps me sane most of the time is uh, a sense of humour. Um, maybe I see humour in the oddest, oddest places too. You know, I, I had this bad reputation in school, uh, secondary school, lower secondary school, when uh, my friends knew me as a person who always got into these terrible laughing fits, you know, in class. And I once uh, had to read something, and the teacher asked her to go in front of the class and read something from a book. I don't know what it was, I can't remember the circumstances now, but something in, uh, struck me, you know, in, in what I was reading. I, I, just, I just 
laughed and I burst out into laughter. I, I couldn't stop and I was sent in disgrace back to my seat. I will never forget that, you know, it was so humiliating. But I just, I just couldn't stop myself, you know, and uh, I don't know, but I, I, love, I love wit and humour in uh, writing, you know, and uh, I saw a lot of it in uh, Professor Enright's writing, you know. I mean, he's just got this acerbic wit, which uh, is so delightful. And you can see how words can be used you know, to, to, to create that kind of, uh, or to move the mind in that way, to, to see the humour in, in situations, in, in people. And uh, I find it very entertaining. Uh, it, it's come out in some respects in my own writing. Mm. Um, and humour is a good teacher as well. Whether humour has a very um, um, uh, precise role as a, as a teacher. Something that teaches you um, about life um, better than perhaps just straightforward lessons. Is that how you feel? Oh, uh, yes. I think uh, one of the things about humor is that to have a situation which is humorous, you need to see certain discrepancies, yes. right? Certain disproportions. I mean, I think that's what creates the humor. And if you see that, I think it enables you to, to get a sense of uh, balance back. Uh, you see things in proportion. Unless you have a sense of proportion, you will not be able to recognize disproportion when you see it, I see. So um, situations or writing which, which puts you in that position to see the disproportion actually restores a sense of balance you know, to your perspective. And I think that's uh, uh, a, a very uh, he healthy thing to have. I've also found that um, humour goes down well with people you know, when they, they encounter it. Uh, my students enjoy it. Um, it generally goes down well in, in public readings. Uh, humorous poems are you know, generally better for public reading than more serious ones. And uh, yeah, I think uh, personally I, it, it's, it's one of the things which uh, I enjoy if I'm able to, to deploy it in, a, in, a, in my own poetry. Um, you mentioned a sense of proportion just now, and I think that nails it for me. Uh, it differentiates um, being humorous from being cynical. Oh, yes. Because if you're cynical, um, chances are you're too close to the object. Yes. Whereas humor allows the, mm. the distance. Mm. You see things mm. in relation to something mm. larger. Mm. Uh, you see the absurdity mm. of things. Mm. There's a difference between making making fun of something and having fun, you know, with something. Um, and having fun is, I think, always always loosens us up, uh, <laughs> creates what what do you call endorphins <laughs> in your system. So uh, Maybe yeah, you I swear that. Uh, something in relation to um, what we said during the break about. Uh, recent writings in Singapore, um, do you feel, um, you, 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 you mentioned that you can't find the connection? Mm. Mm. Um, I don't know what it is, but... Um, is it a change in the sensibilities? I don't know. I, I, I think I haven't sort of thought about it enough. Mm. But I do know that quite a lot of recent writing by our, our homegrown poets um, leaves me cold, like I said, you know. Uh, you're right, I mean, if, if there was more humour in it, I'd probably connect with it better. But it is, uh, it is actually quite sort of bitter, if I could put the word, you know, sometimes. Or cynical, I don't know, it's quite a strong word to use. But, um, yeah, even, even the, the, the playfulness, you know, if there's playfulness, it doesn't seem to sometimes be playfulness for its own sake, which is the best kind of playfulness, I think. Mm. But playfulness which actually uh, wants to hurt or wants to you know, make a point, I don't know. Sometimes if you are too intent on making a point, no matter what you do, whether you use humour or you think you're using humour, it doesn't work somehow. It doesn't work in a sense that it puts people off. It puts people off. So... Um, do you think Poetry should be used to change the world. 
Come on, gosh. If <laughs> you only it could. I think it, it changes people. I think it grows people. Uh, people change the world. Mm. And poetry changes people. Or poetry grows and develops people. So um, I wouldn't say that poetry has a direct role in changing things in the world. It's far too big a thing to change, you know. But uh, if it changes individuals, why not, you know? Individuals have an influence on what happens in the world. And yet for you, it's something else. Um, it's not just trying to change the reader. First of all, he has to change the author. Um, for mm. you, poetry is a very personal, uh, in the sense that it's not about, about trying to trans uh, bring across a message to another mm. person. It ought to be something you engage directly with. Um, it is a means for the author mm -hmm. to find out about yeah. His or her life. Yes, I, I, I find that um, somehow in the, or the author's uh, relationship with his art, the more uh, authentic you are, the more you are truly yourself when you make that work of art, the more it will speak to other people. You know, I think that's a connection between human beings. You don't set out consciously to do that. You do it for yourself first of all. And if we do it successfully, it will connect with another person, you know. So, um, yeah, I think that, that, that's the way I see it. Um, but it, it begins, first of all, with the, with the one solitary necessary thing for the, the author to create. If he does it well, it will touch another person. And it will speak for that other person as well. And it will be authentic for the other person's experience as well. So, what are the traits um, of poet, poetry? Yeah. I don't know. Personal uh, qualities, um, perhaps honesty. Uh, yeah, honesty. In as far as uh, one is always uh, careful not to over dramatize oneself. Mm -hmm. I think that. Uh, Self-dramatization is always a, a constant trap, you know. Mm -hmm. It's quite easy to fall into because you're, you're, you, you, you feel you're projecting a certain sort of person mm -hmm. in that piece of work that you're doing. And, um, and the more people see you in that light, the more mm -hmm. you have to play up to that role. Yeah, yeah. It's very easy to fall into that trap. Of, and and, and self-dramatization, as far as I'm concerned, is a is a veil you draw over your own eyes and you don't see yourself clearly, you know. So, um, it's different from deliberately playing a role, or taking on a persona. I, I see it as, as differently. But if you're, you're trying to, to, to get to the deepest part of you and you want to over-dramatize yourself, I think that's a kind of self-deception, which uh, is, is of absolutely no use to you at all as a writer. Mm, but the kind of authenticity which I think one aims for has to do with um, learning and being true to one's craft. They're always learning because there's always so much to learn. And, um, and being, I think, extremely critical, your own most critical reader when you write. I think there's, there's no shortcut to that. You know, and then having a sense of, of balance, having a being your own reader, mm. your own best reader, and also reading what other people have written. Mm. You know. I think you accept very high standards on your own writing. You take a uh, long time to produce uh, a volume, but it doesn't mean in the time when uh, people don't see your new work, uh, you haven't been working away quietly. Um, in other words, you're, you, 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 you are not in a, in a hurry. In a way, some people some writers maybe to get things out all the time. Mm. I I don't see a need to, to be in a hurry, you know, to do that. I mean, why on earth should I do that, you know? If I'm not ready to write, I, I don't write. Um Yeah, I've been <laughs> extremely unprolific I guess. Uh in all these years of writing what, four small volumes. And in fact, the first volume was like delayed for about 10 years, yes, you know, before I brought it out. It was so, oh, it's, it's really quite embarrassing. But, um, yeah, I, I feel the only poem worth writing is a good poem. Mm. So that's why I write so little, I guess. Uh, but 
in a way, yes, and I mean, when I think about it, I'm not conscious of it in the, in the times when I'm not writing. But I, I think that uh, maybe looking back, you know, things have been sort of gestating. And uh, I know I think a lot. I, I think a lot about the things that happened to me, and the events of life, experiences of life. I don't necessarily put pen to paper about them. But um, there comes a time when, um, when I do, then there's a lot there which actually wants to come out. <laughs> Thank God <laughs> it's there, you know. But uh, yeah, I guess that's how I work. I mean, I, I wish I, I could write more, but I think I need to sort of come to terms with what happens in my life before I can write. And I do need a lot of, of quiet to, to write. I mean, just physical quiet, you know, and, and space in which to write. Because uh, for me, um, the crafting of a poem is a very intensive activity, which I need to do almost at one sitting. So it's, it's really uh, very demanding of time and, you know, then I have to drop everything when I'm doing that. I don't, I don't do it at just one sitting, obviously, but I know that the drafts that I do, I always try to make them as complete as I possibly can. So, uh, and then I'll leave it off and I'll come back to it later, maybe a week or two later, when I'm in a different state of mind and all that, you know? Because I, I need that distance away from it for some time, then I come back and look at it, then I change certain things in it, you know? So, uh, that, that's how I work. What do you find the hardest to write about? All the big, big things like poverty and so on. You know, you, you feel totally inadequate when, when you write about things like that. So, um, but uh, having said that, I, I, f I find that uh, b b b uh, I've, I've come to understand more and more that there's almost nothing that you can't write about. <laughs> the whole world is, is your, <laughs> your subject matter, really. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm discovering uh, in uh, some these pieces I've written recently, um, the whole world of uh, cyberspace yes. and computers, you know, uh, of which I'm very ignorant, I must admit that, you know, but uh, it's, it's become grist for my mill, as it were. And uh, in fact, I've produced a few, a few things which I'm quite pleased about and a great uh, enjoyment writing. So, I mean, I've surprised myself, you know, that I went, you know, this, this whole area, which I've always felt so, um, so alienated from and, you know, so, so ignorant. You, I can actually write something and produce something from it. I know what I'm trying to do. Um, when I look at all these tech terms, they sound to me so inhuman, you know, they sound to me so like things are churned out by a machine. But at the same time, they are also using words that come back to things that are familiar and domestic and things that we know, you see. So what I want to do uh, at the moment, this is what I'm working on, is to try and humanize this whole world of these, all these, uh, these strange and new terms by pr presenting them in a, in, a, in a more familiar context and see what I can do with them. That's, it's it's uh, kind of exploring them, doing which I'm hugely <laughs> enjoying. How, yeah. how, how, how do you describe the kind of pleasures you take away from poetry, whether reading or writing? Um, gosh, I think all, all literature should, and it's not just poetry, um, should give the reader a greater incentive to go on living, you know. Um, I think from the things that we read, it should, you know, give us a greater sense that we that, that living is worthwhile. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but uh, and it's not didactic. It's no. not to teach you how to. Oh no, no, no. It's just uh, maybe you get a better sense of being alive. Uh, you may have more insights into certain things. You may you may get a humbling experience, which puts you in your place. But you realize that's the it's a good place to be, you know. Whatever it is, uh, it's something which should give you more reason to to want to go on living. Mm -hmm. you know. For me, that's important. Can I can I zoom out a little and then ask you that as a poet, um, what do you feel is lacking in Singapore? 
You mean like in general or in the poetry in or? Yes. Mm. I don't know whether we think enough about what we really want out of life. I think it's very easy here because nothing succeeds like success, you know. You success in a certain way. And people just just go on with um, what they get in the media. The media is such a such a huge influence. Um, and you can get carried along, you can live very comfortably, most people here anyway. Um, and and before you know it, you're six. You're in your sixties. You're in your seventies. You know, what has life really been for you? I don't know. I think there's a danger of us, you know, going along like a big herd, uh, a very well-fed herd, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and um, coming to the end of it and and just wondering, you know, what is, you know, what what has life been? Because I think um, it's not just. I don't know. Maybe I should. I shouldn't say this, because I haven't really thought about it. It's not just for the individual. I mean, individually, I think most people will, you know, as they get older and later in life, begin to think about, you know, what life has been for them, you know, what, what have they done, what have they really um, accomplished in terms of being a human being. But as a nation, I don't know. Um, I think we're 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 part of a, a a global, you know, population. If we are successful in some ways, if we have been peaceful, if we have, you know, something to show for our our being, I think we ought to be able to contribute something to the general sense of humanity. Uh, something something valuable than just you know economic success or the beautiful buildings and uh, um, um, I don't know growth every year that kind of thing. I think it's probably more than that. Maybe sometimes less is more. You know, less of all the big, big ma ma material and uh, physical things. If um, we are talking about, let's say, um, climate change and the environment. You know, if even as a small nation like like we are, if we have something to show for that as a kind of example of how we we contribute to the greening of the earth, rather than you know the depletion of it, um, I think that's that's a real a real contribution to humanity. Then. Um, all our GDP uh, figures this is and where the both uh, religious uh, sensibility and poetic sensibility maybe converge um, to make a human uh, more of a person in the world, a uh, person mm. who can enrich the place he lives in or she lives in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, maybe not religion, I don't know, but a certain element of spirituality. Mm. For me, it's, uh, you know, spirituality is something larger than religion. Um, yeah, I mean, the things that are invisible do count for something, I feel. I don't know what it is, but I think it's in our human makeup to, um, to pay attention to these things that are in our human makeup. I think we are the poorer if we don't. Um, but I think it's also necessary for us to I know, yeah, we, we, are, we are also concerned for our own survival and so on, but I think it's Singapore is a you know, small nation as it is. There's something, we'll have something, you know, um, significant to, to share with the world, you know, if it puts its mind to it. Um, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I, was the, I was the writer of that, National Day ceremony song. Which my is this? my my, uh, yes, my country, my home. My country, my my, my home. Yes. It's a, a short thing. No, since 1998. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. It's it's sung every National Day, 
uh, in the schools, right? My they gather in a, my country, my home. Mm. It's uh, not the Kit Chan <laughs> song. Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> no, I think that's got a similar, <laughs> almost a similar <laughs> thing. You can find it on YouTube. Oh, okay. Yeah, mm. it's, uh, it's quite nicely done too. But they, they asked me to write a, a National nice. Day Ceremony song way back in uh, 1998. And uh, I did, and then they farmed it out to several composers, and in the end they chose the police lab, police music lab's version of it, you know. Uh, people like Bernard Tan, Prof. Bernard Tan, uh, Poon Yu Tian, you know, quite a number of people, Iskander, um, Ismail. Yeah, they all, they all had a shot at it, and I heard all the versions, it was so interesting. I mean, the same words, all different uh, renditions of it, it was quite, quite interesting. But why, why I bring this up is because um, I didn't want to, you know, in that, in that song, I don't know if you know it, but the words are, 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 are... I didn't want to go for the usual kind of rah-rah things about our nation. I wanted it to be more a questioning piece. Yes. And, and in it, um, I did insist that whatever we have achieved, we ought to share with the world. That's, that's my feeling always in Singapore. So we, we need to look beyond ourselves, you know. And maybe it's a bigger challenge for us, you know, to look beyond ourselves and just not to be so, like, so insular and, uh, and so self-congratulatory, you know, when we have accomplished certain things. I think we need to look beyond our shores. But I just bring that as an example because that way back I was thinking of that, you know, something else to, to put our minds to. It's probably not appropriate to ask you about uh, how as a... Singaporean poet, you have um, uh, changed in, in addressing the nation. Um, I think for you, perhaps, being a poet is larger than just being one thing or another, um, whether a feminist or a Singaporean or... or, or, or <laughs> yes, or you're, you, I think you're absolutely right. But then, uh, having said that, I have to say that I never think of myself in any of these roles. Uh, when I write, I just write as I am, you know. Um, <clears throat> I don't like labels. I hate labels because they tend to, you know, uh, exclude. You know, a label always excludes what is outside it. And it also makes the whatever you're writing uh, a bit wrong when seen from those angles, from particular lenses. Uh, well, that is, it shuts certain things out. You yes. know, I, I think uh, I wouldn't label myself. That would be a, <laughs> a disservice to myself to to uh, adopt a label. Um, of course, I can't. I can't uh, prevent people from seeing certain things in my writings, uh, even if I don't see them there myself. Uh, it's one of the risks you run. I mean, you, you you try, as the creator of a piece of work, you know, you try to to ensure as much as you can how it should be received, or how it should be read in the case of a a thing made with words. But um, you have to allow for you know, something that is beyond your control. And uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. You know. But it is a, a pitfall a lot of writers in Singapore fall into, um, to want to write uh, as a Singaporean. Uh, the, the, the two ways I think this day is, uh, this game has been played, one to be over-nationalistic, the other one is to be too international, uh, um, to play into those two voices. Whatever it is, is too self-conscious then. Isn't it? Yeah, wh whatever role you, you, you adopt. I don't know whether it's, it's... For me, I think it would be extremely difficult to think of myself as writing on behalf of the nation. I mean, my goodness, it's just too huge a thing, you know. And too amorphous a thing, I can't even envisage it. So I wouldn't even try. I mean, just, just to be true to oneself, you know, to find out what it is one needs to say, needs to say rather than wants to say, it's, it's enough trouble already, you know. It's enough of a job to be done without having to, like, you know, be an activist for this or that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not an activist of any sort. I don't think at all. <clears throat> if I'm activist at all, if I, I'm not, not comfortable with this, this term either. It is that I want um, poetry to be non-threatening. This is just one thing which for a very long time I thought about, you know, uh, in which to some extent, uh, because I, I aim for simplicity in my own writing and clarity, you know, it's, I, I, I'm aware that, I mean, the, the first thing you think of in, in producing a poem is that uh, somebody should read it, yes. 
Okay, somebody should read it. And if you're not able to put that person off, and most people are put off by poetry, you better make that thing accessible, <laughs> you know. So I try and do that. I try to make it transparent and clear and accessible without compromising artistic standards. So that's what I try to do. But other things, no one read Singapore poet, whatever, feminist poet, no, 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 I, know, I never do that. <laughs> never do that, mm. yeah. Mm. And it also it limits the number of things you can write about. I guess, mm. yeah. And it yeah. maybe forces you to take positions you may later on regret or mm. want to change. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I think a poet mm -hmm. is a more versatile uh, 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 position. Uh, um, well, I mean, uh, I think we can't help being what we are at you know, various stages of our lives. So if at 60 I look back and see what I wrote when I was 30, I think I, I simply have to accept that that was what I was, that was what I thought, you know, and uh, then to make peace with oneself. Otherwise, you know, <laughs> it's just being human anyway. I, I want to end this time um, with maybe one last question to yeah. ask you. What do you think you have learned in your own adventure in writing? Mm. Um. Well, I think that uh, writing is a huge adventure because it puts you in touch with so many things in your world. Because you can write about them, you can discover a relationship with these things. And I w perhaps I shouldn't use the word journey, but it is almost like a form of journey towards this thing and that thing and this event, that person. Um, and of course you discover the, the sheer uh, wonder of what words can do. And not just for yourself, but for other people. You, know, you think you use words in a certain way and you achieve a certain effect. But sometimes it does more for another person who comes to it with a different set of experiences, different set of life experiences. And it does something more that you, you did not envisage, but which if you knew about it, you know, you, you're very glad that it did. And that's why I see it as, uh, you know, one of the creative power of, of language. Um, and for me, that's like, it is a kind of bonus, which is in, uh, uh, inherent in language itself, so um, yeah, I mean this is over and above what it has done for me in uh, self-discovery, uh, in giving myself a sense of identity, and also I think just in a very uh, basic and fundamental way, because I'm able to do this, I, I see it as a, as a tremendous gift, I do, you know. I don't know where it came from, because I think in, in some ways I'm a very ordinary person, um, maybe in some ways less than ordinary, uh, because of you know, this, my lack of confidence in doing so many things. But as, as uh, I've been able to write and, and create these poems, which I know objectively are good poems, uh, many of them, it, it, it has boost, boosted my confidence. You know, it's given me much more confidence in, in, in finding that, oh, oh, I'm able to do this. So it's, it's, it, it's a gift that I'm so thankful for, um, which is extraordinary for a very ordinary person. You know, that's all I can say with the adventure of writing. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ubi. Thank you very much. I, um... Lambada by Galilee. They are doing the Lambada by the Sea of Galilee, the singing and the noise blasting up the promenade to the quiet beach hotel where I'm trying to understand this great event of being here, where paralytic, demoniac, and blind found peace at the quiet word of a wandering miracle man. Far from paralyzed, these revelers, though demoniac may well describe the scene, the women, barely visible from my room, but visibly bare, are treading invisible water, their drowning gestures more than a sign of the unfinished work of the Nazarene. 
the band is celebrating a new Tiberian glory, beating up a frenzy of maudlin worship, of love, of peace, shaloms of nostalgic agony, and a new Herodias balls her strange love protest, you're driving me crazy. And indeed, she is driving me crazy, and those of us who thought to find quiet in the land of Galilee. I feel unredeemed tonight, confused by this un-Galilean turmoil. The mind horridly agape, not agape, at the undeniable lure of these sensual songs. I do not know if this silly sympathy is thwarted expectation asking more, or simply the reluctant recognition that these Lombarda lovers, so much more present to the present, would have been warmly welcome at that love feast, and the host himself seen us as very sacred.